So, Miles Simmons, let's just get into our budget on an action-packed week in the National Football League. We're going to start with, we're going to have seven little sec sections of the pod this week. Number one, what's wrong with the Rams? Number two, the NFL is going to change its concussion protocol. By the time you listen to this podcast, there's a good chance they will have changed it. But we're going to talk about the most important thing that nobody, I think except for me, is discussing about the concussion protocol in this podcast. We're going to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. And I think they're absolutely not fluky as the last unbeaten team in football. I saw them in Philadelphia on Sunday in a miserable day. And that's part of the story of the Eagles. So we're going to get into John Harbaugh's fourth down call in Baltimore. Was it right? I think it was. Miles may have some other thoughts, but we shall see. We're also going to get into the Detroit Lions, the most explosive team in football, and also the worst defense in football. So that creates a lot of talking points for these Detroit Lions. We get into the Giants and the Packers. Aaron Rodgers finally playing overseas this week. And can you believe it's not a shock the Packers are three and one. The New York football Giants, three and one? How did that happen? And is it sustainable? The answers, I don't know and no. But we'll get into that. Cooper Rush, who's now four and oh, and he's getting into Garoppolo territory. And finally, we'll talk about why Andy Reid is going to coach till he's 97. It's because of young Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. So we're going to get into all of that. Miles Simmons, hello. Happy post week four. Happy week five to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, it was. It, we're now a quarter of the way through the season, which is something that coaches and players always used to talk about back when the season made sense and it was 16 games. Obviously, now you can't really have a quarter of a 17-game season, but I'm just ignoring the fact that there's a week 18. It's the, You were four games through it. We start to know now who's good, who's not, despite the fact that basically, what, a majority of the league is two and two right now. And I think that that's probably what the NFL loves. It's parody. But there's some real two and two, and there's some fake two and two, I feel like. Hey, Miles, we are going to start this week in the NFC West. And you look at the standings in the NFC West, and you know what you say? <clears throat> What exactly has been accomplished in the first month of the season? <laughs> Nothing. They're all two and two. But yeah. but I'll tell you, my, I'm going to give you one sentence on the other three teams other than the Rams, and then we're going to dive into the Rams. Number okay. one, the Arizona Cardinals. More pretenders than contenders to me because they didn't take their first lead of this season during, during a game until October. The San yeah. Francisco 49ers, as long as they don't get too injury plagued on defense, they're going to be in this thing deep into January. Yeah. And the Seattle Seahawks, who would have figured that when you looked at the stats at the season's quarter poll, that Geno Smith would be the most efficient, accurate quarterback in the league where they play for pay. So I, I, I'm, I'm befuddled by this division, but let's let the befuddlement start at SoFi Stadium and the Los Angeles Rams. Now, they didn't play there. They played in Santa Clara on Monday night. But for the first time, I usually don't try to draw many conclusions until you've seen a team in a few games. The Rams, I would say, are starting to worry me quite a bit. And I'll tell you the biggest part of my worry. It's an overall thing about the offense. First mm -hmm. of all, you know, the protection for Matthew Stafford, 
you know, you're beginning to see why Andrew Whitworth was one of this franchise's five most valuable players over the last few years. Um, Pre-Stafford, post-Stafford, uh, or pre-Stafford, during Stafford, both. Right. Um, yeah. They really miss the Rock of Gibraltar at left tackle. And, and if you see some of the results of that, you, you know, you saw all the sacks on Monday night, but you see a lot of assignment errors. You cannot let mm, mm -hmm. Nick Bosa rush the quarterback on a stunt without being blocked. You right. know, you've just got to be smarter than that. But the biggest problem I see, Miles, is that they just simply cannot run the ball. And yes. if you can't run the ball in the NFL today, even a little bit, you know, Tampa has got one of the same issues. But if mm -hmm. you can't run the ball well in the NFL today, you don't have a great chance. And right now, when I look at the Rams, what I see is a team that is averaging 3.3 yards a carry and cannot be relied on to get Matthew Stafford anywhere near second and five consistently. That, I believe, you know, as we're recording this on Tuesday, the day after the Monday night game, you know, when Sean McVay was driving to work this morning, I feel if he even drove to work, he, he may have just slept <laughs> in his office. That's how despondent he would have been coming off the airplane. But yeah. Sean McVay wakes up today and he says, I have got to figure a way to get our running game going, at least so that it's mediocre. T just give me your overall thoughts right now on the Rams. Well, Peter, it's funny, you know, you talk about the run game because when Sean McVay became the head coach of the Los Angeles Rams in 2017, and that offense was extremely explosive with Jared Goff, I think the one factor that was the biggest factor in that offense was Todd Gurley. It was the run game. Everything that the Rams did in 2017 and 2018, and that's the years that I was covering them, obviously, and then it was obviously the, the time that they were the most successful before 2021 under McVay when they got uh, Matthew Stafford. So everything back then was very, very predicated on the run game, and it was the illusion of complexity. That's the term that they always use, and you want to you make things that are different look the same. And so when you have that run game, that's where everything starts. You use play action effectively, right? You're able to then make guys get open over the middle of the field because you freeze linebackers, you freeze defensive backs because they're so worried about the threat of the run game. And so when you have Cam Akers right now and you have Daryl Henderson and they're not as effective as they can be running the football. And part of that, I definitely think is on the offensive line where they're playing guys who are second back backups, third backups. That's not going to be very helpful for what they need. That's the other part of this is that for a long time, they had a lot of health and continuity on that offensive line. They just do not have it this year. So I agree with you. They can't run the ball. That's problem a, but also when you're looking at the target distribution from Matthew Stafford, how is Allen Robinson yeah. a complete non-factor? You have to be able to get the ball to somebody else other than Cooper cup. The reason why Matthew Stafford threw a pick six last night uh, is because at a certain point, when you just target Cooper Cup after Cooper Cup after Cooper Cup, they're going to start jumping Cooper Cup routes. So that's where you have to start playing things off yeah. of that. And I believe that the Rams are never quite as bad as they look in a primetime game against San Francisco because that's just the way that they've been the last few years. But at the same time, San Francisco has a tendency to expose some things that are really wrong with the Rams. And then Sean McVay has a tendency to correct those things. So we'll see how they can get corrected. I still think the Rams have a chance to be the most complete team in the NFC West. And that's in part because these teams in the NFC West are so, so flawed. So it won't surprise me if the Rams end up winning that division. But like you said, there, there are some real problems and some real concerns. And now they've got a short week before Dallas comes into SoFi Stadium, and that pass rush could be a real problem for that L.A. offense. You know, I, 
I, I was did, doing a little math last night after the game. Um, Sports writer doing math ain't always good, late. Peter. I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm kind of a I'm a I'm a math nerd to some degree, <laughs> but I, I was doing a little bit last night, and I, I realized that you know because I went back and I did exactly what you uh, just alluded to. The Rams, you know, in McVay's first five years and how they ran the ball, averaging 4.24 yards per attempt. The Rams this year in the first four games, 3.34 yards per attempt. They are right. way behind the eight ball. They're a yard worse, and it seems like a lot worse than that. Miles, I want to bring up one other factor with the Rams. You mentioned it. It bothers the tar out of me. And, and look, I think that I understand exactly why Sean McVay is doing this. But if you look at the distribution of passes from, uh, you know, from Matthew Stafford, you see that so far because Cooper Cup was targeted 19 times yeah. Last night, on Monday night, I mean, the the defense knows where they're going with the ball. It's great that Cooper Cup is on this tremendous pace, and he's on pace to shatter his own record for receptions and and all that stuff, and that's wonderful. But it's also unsustainable. And I just want you to look at the other receivers in this group, the other wide receivers in this group. You know, Cooper Cup targeted 54 times. Uh, you know, Ben Skoranek, 16 times. Allen Robinson, who got a boatload of money, 18 targets in four games. That's bad. You yep. know, when Allen Robinson is catching two balls in a must-win, well, I shouldn't say must-win, but in a very big yeah, uh, division game, something's wrong. Something yes. is wrong. And I think I'm particularly bothered by Allen Robinson mm -hmm. at this point. And, and, and if they don't find a way to incorporate him a little bit more seamlessly in the next few weeks, I do not know how Cooper Cup is going to make it through this season. He's just going right. to take too much abuse. Uh, you know, and, and look, Cooper Cup is an excellent blocker. So yes. even when he's not getting the ball, he's getting physically jostled. So mm -hmm. to me, I look at, and I, you know, I'm looking at Allen Robinson and I'm looking at Sean McVay trying to figure out a way to get Allen Robinson the ball more consistently than they have. Yeah, and it's interesting too, Peter, because it just seems like when Matthew Stafford is targeting anybody other than Cooper Cup, he just doesn't look very comfortable. And I'm not understanding exactly why that is. I'm not sure why that is. I don't cover them every day, so maybe that's part of it. But when you look at that offense, there are other talented players there. Tyler Higby's a pretty talented tight end. He's a veteran guy. He's been in that system for years and years and years. So he understands exactly what he needs to do. I wonder, though, if Allen Robinson and the lack of targets that he's getting from Matthew Stafford has to do with the offseason and the lack of time that those two guys got together. Because remember, in that in the offseason, Matthew Stafford was dealing with the elbow problem. So they weren't really having him throw throughout the offseason program. There was a period of time where he really wasn't throwing very much in training camp either. And there were days where he would do some stuff in individual drills, but they wouldn't have him going in those 11 on 11 settings. So I wonder how much that is affecting what we're seeing today where you're just not seeing the connection between Allen Robinson and Matthew Stafford get together at all. Yeah. Yeah, it's bothersome. And I think right now when you look at this division, I think it is incumbent on uh, the head coach of the Rams, Sean McVay, to figure out some alternatives and, and look, it's hard to disguise a bad offensive line. It really is. Yeah. But I think that one of the things McVay might have to do now is he might have to incorporate uh, leaving a tight end in, not just a chip, 
but leaving a tight end in as a sixth blocker um, and, and sacrificing a little bit in your passing game, you know, in terms of alternatives down the field. Just because Matthew Stafford is just getting hit too much. And you're right. They play Dallas, and the Cowboys are not quite as merciless on the rush as the 49ers are, but it's close. So yeah. I think there's a lot wrong with the Rams. So let's get into, let's spend a couple minutes talking about uh, the concussion protocol in the NFL, what they're on the verge of doing. Mike Florio reported Sunday night on football night that they are going to basically make gross motor instability, which has been an interesting clause in the concussion protocol when gross motor instability is a prompt for uh, taking a player off the field and examining him and giving him the all the concussion protocol tests in the locker room. Uh, and if he passes them, he can go back. You know, Florio reported that, uh, that the gross motor instability part, which obviously to a Tonga Valoa a week and a half ago, on Sunday against the Buffalo Bills, showed the gross motor instability. And, uh, you know, when he tried to get up after his head hit the turf, and he was able to come back in the second half, a move that, in retrospect, whatever was said about, oh, it's my back, and whatever, he wasn't in the concussion protocol going into the Cincinnati game on a short week Thursday, and then we all know what happened from there. But, Miles... I wonder, do you think that this could be a turning point in the way the league looks at concussions? Boy, I hope so, Peter, because we love this game, right? We love this sport, and it's an inherently dangerous sport, but there are ways to make it less dangerous. And the more we learn about concussions, the more we should be saying the, the league needs to do everything that it can to make sure that players are as safe as they can possibly be. So whether it's tongue of Iloa and showing that gross motor instability and then being cleared somehow to come back in, or it's somebody like Cameron Brait, we saw on Sunday night, takes a friendly fire hit, which is unfortunate from his teammate, and then somehow is able to get back in before he is then pulled off the field permanently and diagnosed with a concussion. You just want the process to be able to work, and you don't want any players to be able to slip through those cracks, slip through any loophole at all. So the more they can close those loopholes, and the more they can fill in those gaps, the better off the sport is going to be. You know, Miles, I one of the things that I wrote about in my column in Football Morning in America this week uh, that I think is a highly, highly underplayed part of what the league is doing is public perception. Mm. And when you talk about the public perception of the sport of football, you hear it all the time that the NFL just doesn't care enough about the health and safety and the long-term health and safety of the players. Yeah. And eventually it is really going to bite the NFL. Uh, and, and I'll tell you one way it is. I'm just going to read you something from my column this week. I asked my readers, particularly those with kids who might play football, how the situation affected them. This from George Racine of Andover, Massachusetts. And I quote, I played four years of high school and four years of college football. I believe strongly in the, in the good that football has done for me and can do for my nine-year-old son. I want him to be able to play when the time comes. But my wife was watching the game with me Thursday night. And when two of his fingers locked in that grotesque position, she turned to me and she said, and that is why Charlie's not playing football. What possible comeback could I have? End quote. <laughs> so we can talk about how, God, we've got to make it safer. We've got to, football is a sport that is never going to be completely safe. And is right. always, you know, the players in it are always going to know that they're at risk for long-term harm. 
If you choose to play the game, you need to know that. But I think this is at the core of why the NFL, other than the fact they don't want Tua, Tonga Valoa, or any quarterback, uh, y- you know, to be, uh, y- you know, to be a, a, a flawed mentally, you know, right now at the age of 24. I get that. Right. But I think we cannot underestimate the fact that year after year after year, and we'll see how it goes, you hear stories. Such and such high school do- doesn't have enough people to come out for the football team. They're not fielding a football team this year. And, and, and all that, you hear it over and over and over again. And in places like Texas, in places like Florida, I don't think you're ever going to really have, at least in the foreseeable future, you're yeah. going to have huge, big-time high school programs and youth programs and, yeah. and all that. I'm talking about across the country. You know, the NFL has to be careful that not only of turning off the parents, but in making it so that children don't even want to play because they see how dangerous this game is. And who would want to do that? Dad, I'll play soccer. Dad, I'll play lacrosse. Dad, I'll play basketball. I'm not playing football. Yeah, that is absolutely the the issue that you 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 get, and you know I I feel the same as your reader who you know who wrote into you, and I didn't play college football, but I played high school football, and I believe very very strongly in so many of the lessons that I learned from playing that game um, then that obviously I still use today as I talk about football and write about football for a living. So I am, I am very, very grateful to the sport of football for many, many reasons, but I also understand why a parent would be turned off by it. I, I do, but you know, I, I just hope, like I said, that they can make the game as safe as possible and close the loopholes and, and fill in those gaps where people you see have been slipping through. And there are ways that they can do it. Let's move on to one other thing before we take our break and listen to our guest. Um, and that is what I did this past Sunday. Um, I took the train down from New York to Philadelphia. It, it's funny, Miles. And I love I was trains. telling a couple of friends this, that, you know, living on the East Coast in the football season is fantastic. Oh, because man. I got on the train. I could have gotten off the train in Newark and gotten in a cab over to the Meadowlands and watched the Bears and the Giants probably not my first choice of games for Sunday. Or I could have (laughs) gone another 65 minutes on the train and gotten off in Philadelphia and seen the Eagles and the surprisingly good Jaguars. Or I could have stayed on the train for another hour and 10 minutes and gotten off at Baltimore Penn Station and either took a healthy walk or gotten in a cab and gone over to see the Bills and the Ravens, which probably was the game of the day. But I choose to only go halfway, and I, and I wanted to see the Eagles. And one of the reasons that I wanted to see the Eagles is I had never met Jalen Hurts. I didn't go to Eagles training camp this year. I didn't know this team from a hands-on perspective well at all. So I went mm-hmm. to the game, and I really got educated a lot by this team. Just to understand, for those listening to the game, many who are going to be listening to this, probably by the time you hear this, you still are getting this weather that is just, it's the Hurricane Ian aftermath. And it's been raining in New York for about four days. And on the East Coast, it's just been horrible. But on Sunday in Philadelphia, 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. So it's, it's incredibly windy. It is pouring sideways, and uh, it's it's about fifty degrees. I don't know, fifty five degrees, but it was it was cold, and so it was a terrible day to throw the football. So now the Philadelphia Eagles, you have to determine: are they going to be able to be a dominant running team and to be able to run the ball well enough so that 
you know, they're not going to have to rely on Jalen Hurts, who, by the way, entered the game and exited the game with the best yards per attempt in the NFL, which means that he's been throwing the ball downfield and he's mm-hmm. really been taking advantage of Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown. Yep. So what we saw in this game is a team that is capable of winning in almost any way. In this game, Miles Sanders had the best game of his career, 134 rushing yards, two touchdowns. The Eagles ran for 210, and uh, they now are averaging about 170 rushing yards per game uh, through four weeks this year. So to me, when I look at this team, Miles, especially the way they played in the second half and their defense just rubbing, Mm -hmm. The Jaguars faces in it. My gosh, that is a brutal defense. Hassan Reddick and James Bradbury making a huge interception. From afar, tell me the perception you have of the Eagles after a month. They look like the most complete team in the league to me. And I love what you sort of what you were talking about, the adaptability that they have. And they showed that last year under Sirianni, right? When the offense kind of really shifted toward the back half of that season to a primary run-based offense, we're just going to keep our nose to the grindstone and pound the ball, pound the ball with different guys. Jalen Hurts running the ball, doing a great job. You know, they saw Miles Sanders. So, what they're doing now is having a bigger passing game, at least through the first three weeks. And then I think when you see what they can do in terms of that adaptability and shift back to that really, really strong run game again, I think that tells you a lot about how they can be both offensively and then defensively when they first force all of those takeaways on Trevor Lawrence that makes them extremely hard to beat. I mean, you talk about those weather conditions. Those are really, really bad conditions to play football in. Like we talk about, you know, oh man, the elements, and you always got to contend with the elements and it's this and it's that. That's not ideal for football in 2022 anymore where you have these precision passing games and that's what so many offenses are based off of. So the fact that the Eagles can adapt, adjust, and still kind of dominate another team, I think that tells you a lot about where they can go this year. I think the most interesting thing that I saw on Sunday, because keep in mind, you know, I've never met Jalen Hurts. I spent 10 minutes with him after the game. And um, really a, you know, as Jason Kelsey, the center of the Eagles said to me, he goes, have you ever heard the old cliche, which I haven't, I hadn't heard, that communication is 80% body language. I never heard that, but I said, what? <laughs> and and he, he said to me, he goes, Jalen Hurts, it's not about what he said. It is his hmm. body language. He is a confident, he comes into the huddle. He said the first time he came into the huddle in Green Bay in 2020, uh, it, it, you know, he shouldn't have been as confident as he was, but man, hmm. he said he's almost stoic in the huddle and you just say wow this guy has got a veteran presence but so keep that in mind and i meet him and i'm talking to him after the game and we're talking about the game and everything and there was one time in our conversation when a slight smile crossed his lips and he said to me because i talked to him a lot about eagles down 14 nothing fourth Mm -hmm. and goal from like the three and a half Ball's almost yep. touching the four-yard line. Yep. And I thought, man, Nick Sirianni, just get some points here. The first 20 minutes of this game offensively have been a disaster for you. Pick six. Yeah. It's just been a terrible day. Just get three points. Get your feet under you. Get your defense to make a stop, and you'll be back. Sirianni chooses to go for it. So I said, well, okay. And it's a pass. And... Here comes uh, Jalen Hurts. He's at about the 12-yard line. He looks at his first, he looks at his three options. Nobody's open, but he looks at him really fast. You can barely see it. He's like a, you know, the like a nictitating hummingbird. You know, he's just going really, really quick. And he sees, I don't have any great options. I'm going to take off and run. So he runs and he gets in a car crash with Devin Lloyd, the rookie mm-hmm. linebacker of the Jags at the goal line. He, he scores. And so everybody's excited and all that. And first of all, 
Jalen Hurts is unhurt. He cut, he pops up, runs to the sidelines. He's not a big celebration guy, but he comes to the sidelines and I see Sirianni go over and find him and Sirianni says to him, which I found out after the game, Sirianni says to him, you know why I chose to go for it there? Because I trusted you. And let me just tell you this, Miles, and you would know having played football and all that, Jalen Hurts' life is a football life. When he yeah. was a kid growing up in Channel View, Texas, his father coached him throughout high school football. When I talked to him about the lessons of his dad, he called him Coach Hurts. And he didn't That's say, awesome. yeah, I played for my dad. He said, yeah, Coach Hurts, blah, That's blah, blah. Awesome. So these are the things that if you're a coach's son and your coach, your head coach says to you, I trusted you to get us back in this game. That's what makes a kid smile. You know what, Miles? You, you, could, you could tell Jalen Hurts right now that here, here's $100 million. I'm gonna hand you $100 million. Jalen Hurts would be happier if you said to him as, as, you know, as, as a coach would say to him, I trusted you. That's why I went for it. That's yeah. what floats his boat. So to yep. me, I think this is a team, and look, it is a long season. You can't say on October 4th, 5th, 6th that this team is this, that, or the other thing. Times change, injuries happen, uh, teams evolve. But right now, I really like the Eagles. <laughs> I mean, they can yeah. win in a lot of different ways. So um, I think you're right. I think right now, today, in part because of all the injuries that the Bills have had, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think right now, today, at this moment, the Eagles are the most complete team. They may not be the best team come the second Sunday in February, but I'm really kind of fascinated with them. I think you share that fascination. I certainly do. And I, I love that story about Jalen Hurts and his dad and calling him Coach Hurts. I, I love that so much. It, it's it's amazing to me how much Jalen Hurts has improved as a passer. But when you look at all the things that he's gone through in his football career, just from college, right? You go from Alabama to Oklahoma and now being in the league and coming in and not really being a guy who was supposed to be a starting quarterback. I mean, think about it. When the Eagles drafted Jalen Hurts in 2020, they did not really draft him to be the starting quarterback in 2021, let alone 2022. I mean, the Carson Wentz was still supposed to be there and Jalen Hurts was supposed to be a backup. And then maybe, you know, somehow he's got to play and then they figure out that he actually is good enough that they can, you know, flip him for a draft pick. That's probably what they were thinking when they drafted him, but now they've got him. And now he is proving that he can be a franchise quarterback. And when your coach has that kind of trust in the QB, that's going to continue to translate. So we are going to rattle through five topics in the uh, last portion of our podcast. And we are going to start with the Detroit Lions. And look, I did not get to see any of their game on Sunday. I saw a couple of highlights, but... The one thing I really noticed after this game <clears throat> is how Dan Campbell, the head coach of the Lions, you know, obviously they lose the game 48-45. He took no happiness whatsoever in the fact that Jared Goff uh, looks more and more like the quarterback of the future for a team that you know, has, had had some real big reservations about him. But... I'm, I'm impressed with the fact that Dan Campbell seems to be willing to go back to ground zero uh, with his defense. As much as he loves defensive coordinator Aaron Glenn, he knows they've got to do something about that defense. Yeah, and I was listening to his press conference on Monday, Peter, and it wasn't the joyous Dan Campbell that I think we all like to see at the podium. It was a guy who knows that there are a lot of issues with that defense. But what he said was that I believe Aaron Glenn is the right guy for the job 
to help fix this. And that's important. You know, they went through a coordinator change midseason last year, effectively, when uh, basically uh, Dan Campbell demoted Anthony Lynn and he kind of promoted Ben Johnson in season to what they called then basically passing game coordinator. Now Anthony Lynn is with San Francisco. Ben Johnson has that offensive coordinator job, and it is the best offense in the league by the numbers. They are top of the league in points, and they are top of the league in yards. But then you look, and they are at the dead last spot in the league in yards allowed and dead last in points allowed. It is very strange to me to be four weeks in and you have a team that is one and 32 at the exact same time. I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones, Peter, but there's a character in it that says chaos is a ladder. I don't necessarily think that this is the kind of ladder that the Detroit Lions want to be climbing when you're at one in offense and 32 in defense. So let's get into the Ravens a little bit. Um, I really spent a good deal of Monday reading about this, thinking about this, looking at what the odds said, the chart said, but I find this absolutely fascinating that the Baltimore Ravens hung on to the ball for nine and a half minutes in the fourth quarter. They took 15 plays, went 93 yards, and they had fourth and two, or fourth and goal at the Buffalo two, yep. uh, with four minutes and 15 seconds to go. Now, uh, you have to then make a decision. The game is tied 20 to 20. You know that it's a chip shot field goal, a virtually guaranteed three points you know, from Justin Tucker. But then you have to ask yourself, okay, then do we want to give the Buffalo Bills the football at their own 25-yard line with four minutes to go, knowing that, uh, that Buffalo's got three timeouts and the most sort of power-based good quarterback. Power-based, I mean, in terms of when I talk about Josh Allen, um, a guy who... I would fear in the running game more than any quarterback in football because he not only can be Michael Vick, but he can also be Tom Rathman. You know, he yes. he, he can be an absolute bruiser yep. uh, at you know when he runs the ball. So so to me, here's the question: If you're John Harbaugh, okay, do you want to attempt? to get seven points right here and think that your defense can prevent the Buffalo Bills from going 75 yards uh, in the last four minutes of the game and scoring a touchdown? Or do you want to just kick the chip shot field goal and gamble that you can prevent the Buffalo Bills from scoring a touchdown when they have four minutes to go and all three timeouts left? And I have been mind boggled at the number of people who have said dumb decision by Harbaugh. I, I can't figure it out. I want you to talk some sense into me, Miles Simmons. I want you to tell me that I'm wrong in thinking if I were John Harbaugh, I would make that decision a hundred times out of a hundred. Well, the, I, I mean, I, I can tell you that you're wrong, even if I don't think you're necessarily wrong. Uh, but I would say it might be this <laughs> process over play, right? I think where the Ravens might have gotten messy is in the play call as opposed to what the process is. I understand going for it on fourth down. What I thought was interesting is that Lamar Jackson said after the game, if we execute on third down, then nobody is even having this conversation. And we're not having this issue. Right. I mean, on third down, and that was after they had gotten stuffed for a three yard loss. So you're already back to, I think they were at the five, six yard line. Lamar Jackson scrambled. They were at the four. They had third and goal yeah. from the four. And, and Miles, let, right. me, let me just interrupt you and tell you this. So they yeah. had second and goal from the one. Right. Okay. Yes. And, and that's the where the play, thing, that's where it went wrong. Yeah. That is, that is absolutely where it went wrong. And look, 
I like J.K. Dobbins. The Ravens love J.K. Dobbins. The Ravens desperately missed J.K. Dobbins when he was out with a knee injury last year. But if you're a mm-hmm. running back at the one-yard line, you know that the absolute enemy is a negative yardage running play right here. 100%. If you can't get in, burrow your way to get back to the one. Okay, yes. so that is the issue. The fact that J.K. Dobbins lost three and that put him in, I'm not saying a huge hole, but it also ma- it made it third and goal from the four. And right. that is where everything went askew. Yes. And so when you have those things happen, I mean, you got to you got to make a chicken enchilada at a, at a chicken excrement in, in that particular situation if you're J.K. Dobbins. Right. And he wasn't able to do it. He just stuck with the chicken excrement. So now you're at fourth down. And I understand why people would say three is better than zero in that situation. But also you're probably thinking if you're Harbaugh, look, I can go for this. And then I'm going to, if we don't get it, I'm going to try to trust my defense to get them to make a stop for 98 yards, right? We have 98 yards kind of to play with to stop them from scoring a touchdown as opposed to, you know, if we kick it, then it's three points and probably Justin Tucker sends it for a touchback and they start at the the 25. 25. Yeah. Right. But instead, what happens is Lamar Jackson rolls to his right. He doesn't have anybody. He doesn't have anybody. He tries to make something happen. He throws up a duck into the end zone, and then they pick it off, and they don't start at the two. They start at the 20. And that's a huge difference of 18 yards. Miles, the biggest problem there that I saw, okay? And look, um, I understand what Lamar Jackson was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's throwing up a lottery ticket into the end zone. Okay, that's what he's doing. In this particular case, uh, and I'm not I'm not suggesting that absolutely unequivocally on that play you throw the ball out of the end zone, but I do think this is one of those times that you've got to make a throw that only your guy can catch. Okay. Yeah. In other words, you if if I'm talking to Lamar Jackson, if I'm Greg Roman after the game, or maybe Monday or Tuesday, because probably there's a lot of pain right after the game, mm-hmm. I'm saying to Lamar, saying, "Listen, you got to throw that ball where only your guy can get it. You can't throw it up so that it's a jump ball. <clears throat> right. The damage is just too big if we get the ball intercepted." And, and look, the fact is that Lamar Jackson threw two fourth quarter interceptions in this mm-hmm. game, and he contributed mightily to this team losing. And it's not his fault. You know, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that, man, I do not like the, what I saw at the end of that drive. And I'm just saying, I'm not blaming it on the head coach. The head coach said, let's, uh, let's try to put this game out of reach so that we force Buffalo to have to score a touchdown and drive 75 yards. Okay, so we've gotten into that. I want to just ask you, one of the fascinating games this week is a game coming up, is a game that everyone will see. And I have a feeling it's going to be ugly for the Giants, but I had a feeling it was going to be ugly for the Patriots on Sunday. But right now, a good defense can really frustrate the Green Bay Packers. And it looks like the Giants have a pretty good defense. Not a great one. Shaky secondary. But I do think they have a pretty good pass rush. And right now, I think with Aaron Rodgers playing for the first time in his regular season ever on European soil, I don't know that the Green Bay Packers are going to put up a greatest show on turf game (laughs) over at Tottenham Stadium on Sunday. It'll be cool to see Aaron Rodgers over there, but what a weird, weird game. Three and one Giants against the three and one Packers. It is a weird game, and it's the first time that a London crowd will get to see two teams with winning records. So congratulations, London. We're finally sending over our best, I guess, if you want to consider the New York football Giants the best. But eh, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I don't know how the Packers are going to do over there. 
I don't necessarily feel good about them going on a really long trip and maybe I shouldn't, but I don't know. I think about how they've played when they've gone to Tampa at times under Matt LaFleur. All right, you got that game a couple years ago. I mean, the opening game of the season last year, that's kind of one of those longer trips. And yeah, it was in Jacksonville. It was a weird environment, but I don't know how they're going to do over there. I, I really don't. And, and it's interesting too, because every team sort of has a different philosophy as to how you go over to London. Matt LaFleur's done it a few times as a coordinator. I mean, he did it in 17 when I was working for the Rams and he was also working for the Rams. And the, you know, the Rams had a great game against uh, the Arizona Cardinals that year. And then the next year when he was the play caller in Tennessee, they went over there and they had a chance to beat the uh, Chargers in London, and then they just couldn't get that two point conversion. So there are different ways that you can do it. You can go over early, you can go over late, but I don't know how they're going to make that trip. And you know, the giants, they have an opportunity to steal one. We'll see if Daniel Jones plays. I would feel much better about them if he did play, but you know, when you see Bailey Zappi come in and Pappy Zappi look was almost very happy after the end of that <laughs> ball game. You know, and he's a third stringer. Who knows what that defense is going to look like? So I, I don't know if I feel really good about picking the Packers, but the Packers should win this. But I, I don't know just based on everything that can get mixed up when you go to London. Rogers said something after the game Sunday that I really appreciated and I thought was 100% true. He didn't say these are the games you got to win beating crappy teams. <laughs> but but he that's what he meant. You know, I yes. think he said you got to beat teams who are playing their third string quarterback. And he's right. Yes, he is. But I think the same thing can apply this week. I don't know if a gimpy Daniel Jones is going to get his ankle taped up and he's going to find some way to gut out this game um, or if they're going to play. I mean, it looks like uh, Tyrod Taylor is not going to be available so who knows? They may have to play a Davis Webb. You just, who, who mm. I don't know who's going to play for the Giants on Sunday. But yeah. these are the games you have to win. And if Green Bay somehow, someway wins this game to get to four and one with the massive problems they've had getting that offense clicking, it just goes to show you that I must be a genius because I picked the Packers to get to the Super Bowl. And I don't necessarily think they're going to get to the Super Bowl, but I do think if you're four and one, uh, and and you know with the massive problems they've had, they're going to be a factor late in the season. All right, I've got a quiz for you, Miles. Are you oh ready? Boy. Let's go. ESPN has this uh, quarterback uh, ranking thing, this QBR thing that yeah. they do. All right, and and I want to just ask you. There's a player in the NFL right now, one month into the season, who has a higher QBR than Justin Herbert, uh, Tom Brady, Matthew Stafford, Joe Burrow, and Aaron Rodgers. Who would that player be? Is it Patrick Mahomes? No. You know who it is? Cooper uh, Rush. Oh, <laughs> it is Patrick Mahomes. I should have. He does. He <laughs> okay. does have. He does have a higher one. I should have put some qualifications on it. What assumed to be backup quarterback in the NFL this year? Okay, has a better QBR because obviously I think Mahomes is first, but Cooper Rush is 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 fourth in the <laughs> NFL, and <clears throat> I mention that because Cooper Rush goes to play the Rams on short rest this week if, if, if Dak Prescott is not ready to play. There's no reason for the Cowboys to rush Dak Prescott back, coming no. back from a broken thumb. They, they would be smart to let him heal one or two more weeks. And I'm going to tell you why I like Cooper Rush so far a lot. It is the classic case of he takes what the defense gives him. What I think is the coolest thing is that, to me, the real negative stats for a quarterback, uh, you know, in an average season is uh, there's two real negative stats. Number one, 
sacks taken, number two, interceptions thrown. Yeah. If you add up what Cooper Rush has done in four games, he leads the NFL, all NFL quarterbacks in negative plays, you know, in those two categories. He's got a combination of four, zero interceptions, four sacks. He is the That's classic, huge. and I know this has a dirty connotation. He's the classic game manager. I don't know whether he can beat the Rams at, at SoFi, but I like Dallas's chances with a really good front seven and a conservative offense relying on the running game. Now, people talk about game manager as if it's is as if it's bad, but every great quarterback is also a good game manager. And so if you are a good game manager, if you stay out of those negative plays, if you get the offense in the right runs, in the right checks, in the right passing plays, that's a huge deal because there are so many quarterbacks who can't do those things, who are still starting. And then they sometimes have the talent to be able to overcome that. And sometimes they don't. So I like that he is a good game manager. And if you stay out of those negative plays, it allows you to have chances to win. So, yeah, I mean, it's not like they've been playing the 85 Bears, you know. I mean, Washington, right. I don't think they're very, very good. Cincinnati, they were able to really dismantle a lot of what they were doing up front. You know, they beat the Giants, too. So this is a bit of a different challenge. But, I mean, we talked about it. The Rams are absolutely flawed, too. So it would not shock me if the Cowboys come into SoFi Stadium and they leave with a win. You know, I want to spend the last two minutes of our pod talking about Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. And I remember being at their training camp and seeing Patrick Mahomes drill, 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 drill with Marquez Valdez-Scantling, with Sky Moore, uh, with Juju Smith-Schuster, with Justin Watson, with a group of tight ends behind um, uh, behind Travis Kelsey, but there's one other thing that that I think is the reason why Andy Reid is going to coach till he's 87, um, and that is that he has a partner in Patrick Mahomes. Hmm. He doesn't have a guy who um, he says, "Okay, Patrick, here's what we're doing." He has a guy who he says, what do you think? Here's what I'm thinking here. You know, they have yeah. a really good partnership. And I just look at Mahomes after four weeks, 1,106 passing yards, uh, completing uh, 70% or somewhere right around there. Um, 11 touchdowns, two interceptions. And, you know, I just say to myself, so everybody thought after they lose Tyreek Hill, Oh my God, they're in trouble. And I don't know what's going to happen the rest of this year. None of us knows what's going to happen the rest of this year. But all I know is that Patrick Mahomes right now today uh, is as good as he was a year ago when he had Tyreek Hill. Mm -hmm. And he has found a way early on to make a bunch of new receivers feel absolutely, totally at home on this new team in a new offense. And, and I'll, also, I'll also say this, that how about Sky Moore? So Sky yeah. Moore, this rookie from Western Michigan, he comes in and everybody thinks, well, you know, growing period. Uh, he's got some time to learn his craft, blah, 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 blah. Well, to me, when I look at a guy like Sky Moore, and then I look at what he did to play a big role in them losing the game against Indianapolis a week and a half ago, you mm -hmm. know, in muffing a punt and, and really not contributing to that win. Well, what did Patrick Mahomes do in Tampa Bay with Sky Moore? He went to him, you know, targeted him four times, two pretty, one of them was a big catch, uh, two catches in that game. And it just is a great example of how Patrick Mahomes understands that it's going to take all 53, and I am going to get all 53 ready to go. 
He does. I, one of the great things that I think Patrick Mahomes did this offseason was bringing all of those receivers to Texas with him to start the offseason program. That's where they were working out. They weren't necessarily doing everything in Kansas City, but Patrick Mahomes had those guys down there and he was making sure that they were all getting on the same page. They talked about it in training camp. Those sessions in Texas really helped them get off to a faster start, not just in OTAs, but then in training camp as well. And you can't tell me that that has not also translated to the field now. So I thought that they were going to come out with urgency after the way they lost that game to the Colts. And they absolutely did on Sunday night football. When the chiefs play like that, they are very, very difficult to stop. I, you know, I think the demise of the Chiefs may have been greatly exaggerated. You talk about Andy Reid. How, how about Andy Reid in those State Farm commercials? Who knew he was a good actor? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, the one thing I, I just, I'll end with this. You know, in the offseason, they knew that they had to figure a way getting their new guys involved. So... Yeah. In the first four weeks of this season, you look at Juju Smith-Schuster and Marquez Valdez-Scantling. And what I really, really like is that, you know, in the first four games, basically 17 catches, 392 yards. And these are guys who are still getting their Mahomes legs under them. And Mahomes is making it work now. But just watch as the season continues to develop. Those weeks of getting five and six and seven uh, targets occasionally are going to go up to nine, 11, 12 targets, especially Mm -hmm. when defenses take Travis Kelsey out of the game. So this was really a fun, rollicking discussion this week, Miles. I enjoyed it a lot. We covered a lot of ground. Um, we, we had some really educated stuff, um, from our guests this week. And so I'm really happy this podcast, uh, has been really a lot of fun to do with you in the first month of the season. So glad to have you on the team. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here and I totally agree. I think we covered a lot of good ground today. Let's see what happens in the next week. And that's it for this week's edition of the Peter King Podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. Please drop a comment either, you know, on the uh, on the page of our podcast, or you can send an email to me at Peter King F M I A. No dots, no dashes, no spaces. Peter King F M I A at gmail.com. We'll see you again next week with another episode of the Peter King Podcast. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.